Amen. Take God's holy word open this morning to the book of 2 John. 2 John. Begin reading in verse number 1. The elder unto the elect lady. Some imagine John is actually writing to a lady and her family. Others conclude that John is writing to a church, a local church referred to as the elect lady and her children are members of that local assembly. The elder to the elect lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwells in us and shall be with us forever, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ and the Son of the Father in, in truth and love. I rejoiced greatly that I found of your children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that bids him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greets you. Amen. It is with that last phrase that Many believe it is John referring to another church as he refers now to the children of his elect sister, sister churches. And so you see a, a church referred to in this sense as we recognize the church is the body of Christ, it is the bride of Christ. And so local churches is what God works through. He works through local churches and those local churches who are founded upon the things that God founds us on the sure foundation of Christ. Therefore, we are sister churches together as demonstrated even this morning. But the point of emphasis out of all of those words, it seems to be not only the admonition of her that the church continuing to walk in the love of God, the emphasis is found in verse number eight of this, of this whole letter seems to be this point. As John writes, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, which we have labored for, but that we receive a full reward. See, celebrating times like this and taking some time to reflect over where the church has come from is a healthy thing to do from time to time. It's, it's not a place to linger. It's not a place to get caught up in and get so soured on the failures or to get so enamored by the successes that we forget that there's still work to do. It's just to gain some perspective, perspective on where we came from, knowing our roots, our heritage, so that we can get a sense of God's hand working through the years as well as feel a weight of responsibility and obligation that's on every one of us as we move forward as a church. 1 Corinthians 9.24 says that we are to run to win, but here the text teaches us that we're to guard so that we do not lose. It's amazing to me how often things can take years and years and years to build, but can be torn down and lost in a moment. It can be lost in a moment. And so these things go together, aiming to win, guarding that we don't lose the ground that we've gained and, and move forward in God's business. See, some people uh, take things and they lose things on a regular basis. Anybody married and have one of you lose things on a regular basis? Sometimes it's phones, sometimes it's keys, sometimes it's the marbles. Some things are lost on purpose like weight. Some things are lost on accident like those very things that we described. 
But the reality is we must be careful we don't lose anything that's been gained for the glory of God, that the territory that God gives us, that He, that He allows us to be about and be, that we become stewards of that so that we don't lose the things that we are built by. Why don't we, should we not lose them? He says so that we receive a full reward. That means when we lose, when the church loses, when we get distracted and we lose our focus and we lose our emphasis and we lose that big heart Miss Geneva prayed for, when, when we lose those things, we lose more than just mere uh, moments. We, uh, history is at stake. Our reputation is at stake. The rewards of God are at stake. Souls are at stake. And above all, honoring God in this world is at stake. As we just read in the bulletin, it was their focus and determination to realize they bore obligation. They bore responsibility. It wasn't something that you join like today in modern times. People join a church to see what they can get out of it. What kind of, what kind of things have they got to offer me and my children? That is not how this early church started. Because they have programs, they just had people, and they had prayer lives, and they had the Word of God. And they moved forward realizing if this thing's going to become something, it's going to take all of us together, working together. Well, my friend, it's the same thing. Things plateau and we just assume, well, that's still that same small group is going to continue to do all of it while we just enjoy the fringe benefits. We cannot, we dare not lose the things that have been wrought from us, not only from the gospel and the death and resurrection of Christ, but from the inheritance that we've received here as a church family. And so I want to tell you some things from this chapter, as well as from the Word of God, some things that can get lost in the church. Some things that get lost right in the midst of a people still gathering, still thinking religious thoughts, but can be lost if we are not, as John says, if we're not on guard, much of the things that have been worked for can be lost in a relative short amount of time. So what should we not lose? Well, first of all, the church should be careful we don't lose our seasoning. In verse number four, when he says, I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. He says, I, I've, been, I've, been, I've been learning about your church, your, your testimony, your reputation precedes you. Uh, y'all, y'all are real. You're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that was the reputation John is magnifying. He says, y'all, right where you are, John was in his own church, in his own ministry. He says, but right where you are, you are, you're, you're doing and bearing out what God intended you to be, bearing light and being salt. In fact, he closes it with saying in verse number 12 that when he saw, when he was with this church face to face, they would celebrate in joy, joy in the church. See, there ought to be that good combination of the willingness to sacrifice and the willingness to serve and to work and, and shed blood, sweat, and tears over something greater than yourself, but do so in a spirit of joy. Jesus referred to this as salt. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 13, you are the salt of the earth. That's what he states. Now, what is salt? Well, salt is a preservative. Salt is a purifier. That the indication is it's useful, it's spicy, it speaks of, of influence in a community, spiritual power, it speaks of being used of God. But he closes that verse by saying this, you're the salt of the earth. God plants these churches like this and Homestead's Baptist Church with an intention that we are to saturate and preserve a community and preserve the word of God, the testimony of the gospel right there. He says, but if the salt has lost its savor, you're good for nothing. You're only worthy to be cast out into the streets and to be trampled under the feet of men. Jesus, a church and a Christian has a point and a purpose, and the emphasis of the church is to be salt. And when we are no longer salty, when we no longer have the joy of God, the power of God, and the focus and the mission of God on our minds and in our efforts, then what is the point? Let's shut the doors. Let's go home, watch the ball game. He says a church can lose its seasoning. We lose the very spice. We are salt and therefore are to live out the purposes of salt, of preservation, of purification, and to stand out in distinction from this world. God help us. I, I, I made me want to be many things and be willing to live with many things. I don't want ever to be considered useless, good for nothing. The second thing that can be lost in a church is not only the seasoning, but our sincerity. 
That's the emphasis of verse number one when he says, whom I love in the truth, he says. Verse five and six, the emphasis again upon love. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do to the brethren and strangers. I'm sorry. Verse five, and now I beseech you, lady, not as I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which we had from the beginning. This is the same commandment, same standard that we love one another. And this is love that we walk after his commandments in obedience to God. And this is the commandment that you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it, walk in love. So he says, what should characterize a church is love, heart, compassion, empathy, feeling, something that you feel, something that you express through God's outpouring of grace and mercy upon us that we are to continue to pour out to others because Paul taught us in 1 Corinthians 13, you can have it all. You can have all the money and all the talents and all the ability, but if you don't have love, it is all for nothing. It is without purpose, without point. The exact reason Jesus called on the church of, of Ephesus in, in Revelation chapter 2 that you've got all this formalism and it's good and I like what I'm seeing, but you're losing heart and I'm calling you to repent. Keep the actions, but go back to heart. Because without the heart, God says, I'll remove your usefulness. I'll remove your candlestick. And so sometimes we got to be careful we don't lose our love, right? Remember it's amazing when, when, when Peter failed the Lord and cursed him and, and, and denied even knowing the Lord. The only discussion Jesus was, was, was emphasizing with Peter at his next meeting was, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? So you don't have to know all the analytics. You don't have to know all the theology. You don't have to know all the history. All you got to do is know you love God and you're willing to follow out that love. And his one commandment that, that centers in the church, and that is love others as well. The church with love cannot survive as a church. It can survive as a meeting place. It can survive for entertainment, but it cannot survive as a church. And so sometimes we come in religiously, watch this, sometimes we become Judas. We're Judas churches where we hug up to Christ. We even give him kisses on the cheek as if we're loving, but our hearts are far from him. Jesus says, you draw near to me with your lips, but your heart, your heart is far from me. It's not, it's not it's just about singing in the choir, serving in a ministry as we have all over every week. We have all over this county different ministries or, or, or preaching sermons or, or, or participating uh, in the worship itself. It must be with heart. And if we're not careful, we can go through the formalities and offer God no heart. And when you don't heart, go for God any heart, he knows the difference. Valentine's Bank Day, you can bring candy, you can bring flowers, but my friend, if there's no scent of heart on it, you might as well just have left it alone. Unless you're buying something expensive, right? I mean, <laughs> but sincerity must not be lost. I'll tell you what, from my own heart, the best way to regain our own sincerity and our own heart and our own genuineness is this. My friend, it ain't just uh, going through a class after class after class. I encourage you, fall on your knees, spend some time remembering Calvary. Remembering the blood, remembering the sacrifice, remembering the perfect son of God opening his arm, not no one taking his life, him giving his life for you and I. My friend, nothing can stir the hearts of our love is when we remember his for us. God help us not to lose our sincerity, the genuineness. Number three, what can get lost in a church? Our supplication. Verse three, for I rejoice greatly, or, or rather... He says, grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. He says, I'm praying this for you. I'm praying God's favor and blessing and peace from God the Father, from the Son of God. That This is my prayer for you, extending this kind of prayer of blessing on the church. Why would Paul or John take such a short letter and include a little prayer into that? Because my friend, out of 13 verses... There's nothing more central to the church and its life and its power than prayer. See, when you're a young Christian or when you're young at anything, you're praying desperately because you know unless God shows up, this thing will surely fail. I can just imagine the early prayer meetings of the first of church 40 years ago, right? Knowing all we got now is a building. Now, now we got, you know, we're going to have bills. We got this, we got that. But God, you're going to have to bless this. No doubt the prayers were serious and they were vibrant. 
But somewhere along the line, when things start working out and everything starts smoothing off and we say, we got this. And, and so no longer are our prayers, do they have that urgency to them or desperation to them or, or, or boldness to them because we figure out how to do ministry. But the problem is, my friend, you remember in the time where uh, Jesus stood in the middle of his temple and there was all kind of activities all kind of stuff going on, all kinds of people in the church, but Jesus had to stand and rebuke them because he says there was no prayer. In fact, their activities were now hindering their prayer. And Jesus rebuked them all like a man would. And he stood and he says, this is my father's house. It is called a house of prayer. It's the emphasis of the house of God is is the prayers that we come and we worship in our singing as well as in our our speaking before God, as well as our listening to God through His Word. The whole atmosphere of worship should be one of prayer. And when we lose prayer, you you see, here's the thing about it. Here Jesus was right in the middle of of the temple, in in the synagogue, and they're not even realizing He's there. Imagine all this vain worship inside the temple. There's the Son of God that is the creator, that is the central point of their worship, and nobody even knows He's there. It is amazing, though, when He was born, all those who were praying and spending time before God, they all knew who He was when He was just a little bitty baby. I'll tell you this, church, things are hidden from those who do not pray. Things are blessed and rewarded when people pray. Every Sunday school class should start in prayer. Every meeting should involve prayer. Our people should make sure we're spending time in prayer when we're together and prayer when we're apart. The church will be built and sustained and grown and strengthened by the prayers of God's people. Why? Because it takes it off of us and it puts it where it squarely belongs on God Almighty. I'll tell you a fourth thing that can get lost right in the church. And that's the scriptures themselves. But verse 1 of this book starts out by saying, The elder unto the elect lady and to her children whom I love in the truth, he emphasizes. But also all they that have known the truth, he emphasizes. Verse 2, for the truth's sake, he says. Again, verse number 3, over and over and over, you see this emphasis upon the truth. He said, this is what the church is. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. It's what the church is to be. It's the place when people get sick and tired of trying to live out the philosophies of this world. They they come in beaten and battered and broken and confused and ignorant. They ought to be able to come in the church and hear truth because truth sets you free. Truth will bring life. Truth will bring deliverance. Truth will make things, bring them out of chaos and put them into order. It's what the church is supposed to be. And the church thinks that they're compromising, that they're doing communities good when they water down the truth or put it out entirely. And so where these grand churches come and they talk about how they got a Bible, but then they never preach from the Bible. And if there's ever anything that comes out, there's not a whole lot of Bible. There's all kind of uh, information and there's things and topics to talk on and five points that'll make you feel pretty inside. Then my friend, there's no Bible truth being shared. And the scriptures can be lost. And he refers to, I love how this letter uh, progresses because he says, you've known the truth, right? That includes the gospel and salvation and, and receiving Christ who is the truth. Verse 2, he says, the truth actually now lives inside of us, right? The spirit of truth who leads us and guides our life. And then verse 4, there's the practicing of the truth. It's not just saying, I, I know the truth in my head. He says, no, the only truth that is real will be the truth that you see through your feet and through your hands and out of your mouth. And he says, that's the truth. It's knowing the truth and then living the truth by the truth that lives within us. And so, my friend, the truth is to constantly, the church is to constantly be on guard of the truth of the scriptures. Because when we're not, one of two things happens. Either the church goes, tilts this way and falls into all kind of liberalism where nobody even knows what's wrong. It is unbelievable. These dominant denominations throughout the, the centuries that have been on the front lines of being sought and preserving the culture have now completely turned to perversions and ungodliness. There's no place for the truth because they're too much uh, in trying to appease people and make them feel warm and fuzzy in their services rather than giving them the greatest thing you can ever give to them, and that's the Word of God. And so we've got to hold up the Word of God so that people don't spend their lives in some hopeless aim to to find life and purpose and meaning and peace and things that will never give that. 
We must maintain the truth so that we don't tilt the other way and all of a sudden start becoming a church of man-made rules where people start making rules and it becomes a legalistic church. We don't need the Word of God anymore because we got Bubba over there that can give us all the rules of all the things we don't need to be doing. Right? No more of that clapping in church. Right? Get rid of them drums. Uh, we're going to start measuring hairstyles and dress styles and we're going to come up with all these rules that before long you're going to be stiff and dead because you're going to be worried about sneezing and somebody getting offended. We have to have the Word of God because if not, people will manipulate your mind and they'll teach you, thus saith the Lord, and God didn't say it ever. So we must know the Word of God, preserve the Word of God. It amazes me, even all the way, as much as God used the Jewish people to preserve the Old Testament, all the great links they went to to make sure they preserved the Holy Word of God. There was a time in young Josiah, he came after a wicked king of Manasseh who had been the king for over 50 years and, and then uh, his son. And then here comes Josiah along, a young king. And all he knows is, well, the church, is the church being built? Are they got the temple repaired? Are they getting in the money? Is the money coming in to pay for that? And so he, he sends uh, Shaphan down to Hilkiah, the priest, and says, hey, go down there and make sure all this is working out. And he goes down and guess what he finds? At the church, at the temple, they found that they got a bishop, right? Because they got the high priest, Hilkiah. They got a budget, the money's come in. We got the money to pay for all this stuff. And they got a building. You know what they didn't have? They didn't have a Bible. Here's how it worked out. This is exactly how it's worded. Hilkiah says, hey, we've been cleaning up the church over here and we found this book. So he says, we found this book and he gives that book to Shaphan and Shaphan takes that book to Josiah and Josiah starts reading the book and it ain't just a book. It's the book. It's the word of God. And he realizes our nation is in trouble. And you know what this young king did? When the judgments of God were already predicted, were already coming, Josiah begins to rip his clothes and bring about repentance among the nation and reforms to, to, to come back to God. And you know what God did? God still was going to bring the judgments. But you know what he did in Josiah's day? He backed them off and he held them off because a man of God and the people were seeking God afresh in repentance. Why? Through the word of God. God help us. That's why we read in the Word where John says you got to fight for the faith. John says, you, you don't even, we just read it in verse number 10, you don't even welcome. I hear people talk about people coming in their doors and this and that. John says when they come with their false doctrine, don't even welcome them in your house or you become partakers in their evil doctrines. And so he says there's all kind of false teachings out there uh, about who Christ is and, the, and so forth. And we must stand upon the Word of God. Paul says, hold fast the form of sound words. Why? Because Psalms 138 verse 2 says, God magnifies His word above His name. That means, my friend, there is no worship without the Bible. I don't care how many singings you go to, how many poems, how many testimonies are read. I don't care how powerful and wonderful and emotional the services are. My friend, if you don't have time for the word of God, you did not have church. Because this is center stage. This is the only book God ever offered. And it's the one He's authored Himself. And it's the one He speaks to His people through. Yes. Amen. God help us not to lose the Word even in the church. Verse number 7 says the church can even lose the Savior. He says because that for... For many deceivers are entered into this world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Is upon that verse he says, guard and don't lose. But why would such a warning be needed back then? I mean, we're 2,000 years and we know what's come about and we know all the, the competing names and, and works and religions and how many different religions own a Jesus of their own making and a certain spirit of their own making and a certain God of their own making? Their own opinion of God and their own opinion of Jesus. Yet John was saying all the way back then the deceivers were already present, already twisting, already turning, already manipulating the idea of who Christ is. And he puts it up in front. He says, Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Jesus the Christ came in the flesh God came in the flesh. And he says, if anybody comes preaching another Jesus, people, I mean, early even as a pastor in the Southern Baptist Convention, I hate to say this, but I want to tell you what, I don't know how I'm so thankful for the Adrian Rogers and the, and the, uh, uh, these, these men of God, Paige Pattersons and different ones, Charles Stanley's, 
who back when I was a young minister and all of a sudden the creeps of liberalism were coming in and people were saying, as long as people believe in Jesus, they should be welcome. Well, my friend, the problem is, which Jesus? And the debate was, well, all people need to say is, well, they believe the Bible and that should be enough. Well, every one of them owned the Bible. Every cult owns a Bible. And so it does make a difference, not just that you believe the Bible, but what you believe the Bible teaches. That's important. And the Southern Baptist Church, that's what ties us together. We're an independent local church. We're not a hierarchy. Nobody dictates anything in this church. But this church has chosen 40 years ago to collect themselves with 40,000 other Southern Baptist churches, pull our money together and share the gospel around the world. But here's the problem. Many times we can have church and lose Jesus. That means you can come in and have a gathering and we could do a bunch of things and the Son of God be like He was in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. He's already outside the door. They're having church and Jesus is knocking on the door saying, hey, will y'all let me in? By the way, He says, if you'll hear my word, that's, that's the connection. If you hear my word and, and open to me, I'll come in and I'll, I'll have fellowship with you. But as long as you stay away from my word and stay away from my ways, I'm going to stay outside the church. And, and it's amazing. By the way, as parents, isn't it amazing his own parents lost Jesus? Now, if your mom and daddy can lose you, anybody can lose you. And you know where they lost him, by the way? They lost him where? Yeah. At church. And the, the, the way they're celebrating was the Passover. So it's like for Passover for us would be Easter, right? It'd be like going to church at Easter and doing everything else. As people many times do, they're too busy hunting eggs and worrying about bunnies than they are the Son of God who died on the cross and rose again the third day. That is a marvel to me. It's a marvel to me. I'm telling you what, right in the middle of church, people can leave the star of the show and the man of honor off the itinerary entirely. And by the way, I'll tell you this. Remember where his parents found him? Right where they left him. And churches get off track and everything begins. You begin to discern a loss of the power of God, and the influence of God and the hand of God upon your life. My friend, the, the trek is a bad one, but it's a short one. All you do is go back to where you left the Son of God because he never moves. I close with verse 9 through 11. You know the great tragedy of a church, if we're not guard, uh, being careful we don't lose what's been labored for? One of the great tragedies is we lose the entire mission of the church, and that is souls of men and women and children get lost in the church. This is what he's speaking in verse uh, number 9 where he says, uh, whosoever transgresses abides not in the doctrine of Christ. He doesn't have God. If you don't have your doctrine right, you don't know God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. There's more than just a warming of the heart. There's more than just a religious uh, blanket religion. It is knowing specific things about Christ, who he is, specific things about the Father, who they are. And he says, they're coming in on you again, bringing out this doctrine. Don't let them in your house and don't say, God bless you and God speed. For he that bids him God's speed is partakers of his evil deeds. Right in the midst of the church, you have the deceived. The deceivers and the deceived. That means right in the midst of the church, there can be a gathering of people and that the church can lose such focus to where the people that are there are lost. I've recognized just in my own Christian life, you're going to church with people. And Jenny said a while ago when she got baptized that she was so full of joy when she looked out, the faces didn't reflect that same joy. I say they still don't all the time either. <laughs> Jesus taught us in Matthew 13 the reality that the net is, is cast out, but it also gathers in both good and bad fish. We're to be un, no muse that a church can have lost, saved people and lost people in it, right? Sheep and goat and wheat and tares right in the midst of a local church. That's the way it was in the New Testament. Every New Testament epistle, when Paul's writing, he's writing to a church, but he's also addressing, he always addresses lost and saved people. He didn't, for any uh, imagination, think everybody he was writing to in Ephesus were all bona fide born-again Christians. That's not how the letters are written. They're written to a church, a local church, but knowing and challenging that religion and challenging that faith because sometimes the church can get so distracted on other things, even good things, we leave off the best thing. See, the commission we were left with is to preach the gospel. The mission is to make disciples. 
And that mission carries in our backyard, throughout our extended areas and all around the world. And we are called to affect people with the gospel. And yet right sometimes right in the midst of us, people are lost right in the church. I'm telling you, my own mother is probably watching right now, so she knows what I'm about to tell you. It's true. I was talking with my brothers when my mother three years ago started asking questions about the gospel and listening to the answers. And uh, I was going through and sharing with her and I was talking to my brothers and we were, we were getting this kind of um, hesitant but enthusiasm about what might be taking place in my mother's heart. So as I was talking to my two brothers on conference calls and we're praying for mom and we're talking about mom and, and her asking the questions and she started attending one of my, my brother's churches and one of them says, well, at least she's going to church. And I'm like, guys, we, we've got to get that out of our mind. I am not satisfied with a church member mama. I got too many people. We got too many people now. Church members of Lantana Road may very well be lost. Yeah. We don't, I, don't want to, I don't want a church member, mama. I want to save mama. I want a Christ following mama. I want a born again mama. And so we got to strike while the iron's hot. We got to pray hot and heavy for God Almighty to do his full work in mama's heart. And I want to tell you what, thank God, thank God he did. Yep. Amen. We could just be talking about, yeah, mama ain't missed church service. I'm glad to say, no, mama knows God. Yes. Don't lose the souls. It's amazing to me sometimes. Have you ever lost something that's right under your nose? I was, I was sitting there one time with somebody say, I can't find my phone. I'm like, you're on it. <laughs> In Luke 15, a whole chapter about lost people. You know what it tells us? He compares it to a shepherd who leaves his one sheep. He compares it to a father who lost a prodigal son. But the most curious of all those is the woman who lost her money. Can I get a witness? And she lost that money in her own house. How does that happen? No telling. How, my mother-in-law is notorious for throwing money in the trash while she's throwing everything else away. We get on her all the time. Hey, 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 don't leave money laying around when Mimi's around. But she lost it in her own house. And so she's sweeping the floor, trying to find the silver right in her own house. I'm telling you this, church, sometimes people can be right here. We can think, man, there's the drunk out there. There's the inmates. There's these uh, at the homeless shelter. There's people all outside that need to be saved. I'm telling you what, sometimes it's the people sitting in your Sunday school classes sit right next to you. I mean, they may be family members in your households. And we got to make sure that we don't just go along with a bunch of assumptions and not realize there may be people right here within our church and in our own community and in our own families that need to get to first base. They need to hear and receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the first business. That's the mandated business. God, help us not to forget that and let people be here and never hear the gospel. I want to grow as a Christian, right? I want to hear the word of God and learn how to be a godly husband, daddy, granddaddy, all these type of things. We must never lose the gospel emphasis inside these walls and inside our community. God, help us not to lose our heart and think we have a whole lot of things scheduled on our, on our plate that will appease God and miss the mission of the church is to go share the gospel. Heard of a lady in Crossville, Tennessee, just recently. I've been stewing on this. This has just been so overwhelming. Just in the past few weeks since I learned it, a lady and her mom were living in a house in Crossville, Tennessee. In the past few months, they've been living there, I'm thinking five or six years with no power, no water. And the house was falling in on itself. The mother died Someone came along to, to help the daughter, which is senior adult age, and, and tries to help them get everything figured out and what's going to happen and, and, and trying to give them some assistance and so forth. And so they do. And, 
And one began to inquire and say, You're, you know, I remember your grandparents, they were big into cattle and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, they, they, what, what, what happened? To, what happened to all the money they would have made? And she says, I don't know what happened to their money. And he says, well, did they keep, keep it in a bank? And she says, no, they didn't believe in banks. And he said, ma'am, you mind if I just look around your house place, home place here? She says, no, help yourself. And so this gentleman goes, help his family, begins to look around and dig through all these piles of stuff and began to find suitcases full of money. He told me the other day, so far he's found $55,000. Isn't it amazing? Going without power and water, and sometimes food, when all along you're sitting there with all that treasure, all that provision. Church, can I say this to you? I don't know where you are. Uh, in your walk with God, where you are in church life. We've just kind of personalized all this this morning because that's what we are. We're a local body. We're a local body in Christ. And sometimes we can begin to lose our own senses and think like even in a marriage where we begin to look and say, well, look out here and what's over here and what's over here and what's... And can I just say, can we put ourselves in a frame of a mind of a handful of people who said there's a work of God needed right here in this county? And can we say, there's been this work going on 40 years. What involvement have you had? What involvement do you still have on a week-to-week basis? I look back at their old bulletin. They have stuff going every night of the week. You know, this week we have this. This week the business meeting. This week, this day's visitation, the whole week. And, and, and we're, we're trying to scamp around just to say, hey, can you come to church on Sunday night? Can you come to church on Wednesday night? I'm telling you. For God's work to continue to sustain and grow in another group celebrating 40 years from now, it'll be because some people in this church caught that same vision and realized we got some treasure right here. We ain't got to go anywhere to see the glory of God. We can see it right here. But it takes people to realize it and then in, invest that and employ that and use that and show up and say, hey, coach, I ain't much, but I'm here. Use me however I can be used because there's still children still needing to learn Bible verses and there's still teenagers still need to be chauffeured and, and, and chaperoned and all that. And then there's still, there's still uh, widows and widows in this church, I think now about 25 that could be ministered to you. Everyone, what could I do with ministry? Call, hey amen, call. We'll load your wagon. There, there's still ministries over here at the uh, homeless shelter, uh, the, the nursing homes, the prison, uh, the, the local college where we're ministering in. There's still people here that need the gospel. My friend, God help us take, celebrate 40 years and say, we ain't old, we're young. We got a whole lot more to do before Jesus comes. Amen. Let's bow for prayer today.